preaching God's standards or my own. Um, that is a real test for anybody that gets into ministry, a man that gets into ministry. Um, whether to preach your own standards, the things that you've gone through and whatever else, and your feelings and your opinions, or what does the Bible say? And um, the reason there are so many different churches out there and so many different styles and whatever else of professing Christianity is because they interject their own thoughts and their own feelings into it. And they don't look at what the Bible standards are. God's perfect standards that he set up in the beginning and that he intends you to live that way and that's the best way to live. Um, the Bible is a book about the sinfulness of man and the perfection of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible oftentimes will, will record things that man has done that are wrong and people will take that and say, well, see, you know, Moses killed somebody. So, you know, I haven't killed anybody. You know, I'm, I'm not a saint by any means, but hey, I never was like Moses. Or they'll look for sinners in the Bible. Well, the Bible has plenty of examples of sinners, certainly. But what are God's perfect standards? See, that's the issue here. Uh, it's not about me. What, you know, when you're called into ministry, you, you look through the Bible and say, okay, what did God originally intend for man to follow, for man to do, whatever else? And that's what you should be preaching and teaching, not saying, well, God's standard is this, but I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of people that broke that standard, and then we're going to go with what they did. See? Man's temptation is to say, well, there's a lot of other people like me. There's a lot of other people that are doing things like I want to do. And so I'll go with that. And I think I'm going to be safe because they're alive. They're getting away with it. You know, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. I don't want to have to live by the scriptures. I'm going to live by what everybody else is doing. You see, I'm going to show you some examples of that today in this study in our King James Bible. Matthew chapter 19, I'll show you the first example of this. Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. It says here, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? When you get into ministry, you will have false um, religious people that follow you and try to tempt you and try to mess you up. Just the way it's going to be. I mean, you see it with Paul, you see it with Peter, you see it with John, you see all of them. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, you know, the, the philosophers, all these different people. They will follow you and try to mess you up. They'll try to trip you up. Hey, I have a question for you. You know, I mean, look at, look at the people that attack me. It's exactly what they're doing. You know. Oh, did you ever hear of this? Or did, what about that? Or what, you know, they're not trying to hold me accountable to the word of God. I can accept that, you know, that that's fine. But what these people are trying to do is they're trying to trip Jesus up and they'll try to trip you up too. If you're a follower of Jesus, they'll look at you and try to find hypocrisy in your life. In other words, okay, verse four, and he answered and said unto them, have ye not read that he, which made them at the beginning, made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Okay? He just gave his original standard there. Jesus Christ is God, and he says, uh, My original perfect standard is there, that a man is to leave father and mother, and cleave unto his wife. And I've joined those two together. Don't put that asunder. God's original intent was not for people to be married for a while, and it's not working out, so let's just get a, a divorce. That's not God's intent, okay? But let's keep reading here. Verse 7, they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Oh, they think they've caught him. No, they didn't. They're dealing with the Lord of glory here. You know, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. Um, truth. <laughs> uh, you're not going to get him. Verse 8, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffer you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. In other words, God says, here's my perfect standard. Okay, there it is. That's the way I've made it. Don't mess it up. Man comes along and messes it up. Why? Because God gave man a free will. Okay, man comes along and messes it up, and then it's okay, now what are we going to do? Hey, 
you know, this, this perfect standard that you had, we messed it up. So what do we do now? Uh, well, you shouldn't have messed it up in the first place, but okay, now we have to make a thing for divorce or whatever else. Um, you know, it's just a, a, a way I can say it is you, you take a forest like this out here and it's, it's beautiful and it, and it's got really nice big trees in it or whatever else. And you have, you know, logging practices that are, that are good and, and sustainable in terms of, uh, selective cutting and, and things like that, that you can cut trees down, cut the bigger ones, leave the new growth. And if there's trees that are really crooked and whatever, you, those are cull trees, you get rid of those. There's a lot of good practices in forest management, but you get some of the loggers and they'll just come in and just rape the forest. They'll take, you know, if, if it grows out of the ground, it gets cut down, you know, is their motto. If there's any kind of money at all, you know, be it pulp or firewood or, or, you know, they'll do whatever they have to do to make money off the of land. And they'll take their huge machinery in through and they just wreck the forest. Um, and so what, ha what has to happen? Laws have to be passed to protect the forest and to protect private landowners and things from, from bad logging practices, you see. You say, well, then, then the laws should be there. The laws shouldn't be there in the first place. But man in his sin, man, because of having free will, comes in and messes up something that was perfect in, to begin with. God created nature. Okay, He created it beautiful and it's, and it's wonderful and everything else. But man comes along in his sin and messes it up. You see, God's perfect standard in the beginning was for a man and a woman to be married for life. God joins you together. Don't put it asunder. Don't tear it apart, in other words. But for the hardness of your heart, there's a writing of divorcement. Okay? There's no... The, the, the biblical grounds for divorce, by the way, is fornication. And, that, and I've seen that thing. I've seen it with, with saved brethren. You know, you get, you get married and, uh, you know, she joins herself to it. You know, some guy marries a, a woman, thinks that she's saved or whatever, or they get married as lost people. He gets saved. She does not. She goes out and cheats on him. She's committing fornication. Well, she's joining her body to another man. They're becoming one flesh. Therefore, you have grounds to divorce her. You say, well, then you're for divorce. No, I'm not for divorce. <laughs> but it's there for the hardness of people's hearts. You see? God's perfect standard is get married, stay married. Don't get a divorce. Work it out. You see? But because of man's, the hardness of man's heart, because of sin, God says, okay, there are grounds for divorce. show you another one here. Acts chapter 17. Turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 17. show you another one of God's perfect standards that has been severely messed up, horribly messed up. <laughs> and uh, people will take the messed up thing out there and then they'll say, okay, that's, this is the new truth. You know, um, God, yeah, God might have intended it for man and a woman to stay together for life back in the past, but the new truth now is you just get married and divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried and you'll eventually find the perfect companion, your perfect soulmate, you know. Uh, that's the new standard. No, 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 no. God's perfect standard is still there, all right? But because of sin, people have broken that perfect standard. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? I'll show you another perfect standard that man has broken, horribly broken. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. We can talk about church buildings. We won't go there right now. Um, Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. God controls everything. So I don't believe in God. Well, uh, that's a problem because you don't believe in the source of your life. Um, verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Okay, so many people will stop right there. We're all of one blood. Uh, that means you can marry whoever you want to. Uh, no, keep reading. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Bounds of their habitation. We're gonna sh I'm going to look at that here in just a minute. Why is this so important? Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. All right? Um, people that are in the bounds of their habitation, there's a better chance of them finding God. 
and the better chance of the Lord communicating with them. You get to be around your own culture, your own people and everything else, um, you're going to be in a much better position to get to know the Lord and to be in better health and so many other things. And I mean, there's so much science to back this whole thing up. You know, um, you get out of the bounds of your habitation, there's all kinds of problems. You say, well, what about you? You're an American. You're, li you're living in America. That's not the bounds of your habitation. You should be back in Germany. I agree completely, Co wholly and completely. You say, well, then what's going on here? Well, God's perfect standard is the bounds of their habitation. But man has messed it up. My ancestors, the Denlinger family, Denklinger, uh, in the original German, <laughs> um, they came here in 1714 to this country. I have the, the proof. Uh, my, I've been studying some of my genealogy type of stuff, whatever else, as far as not endless genealogies, don't go there. I'm just saying, when did my family come here? They came to Pennsylvania in 1714. Okay, none of my ancestors that came here were alive when the Revolutionary War even happened. All right, uh, we're talking way before the Revolutionary War. Why? Because my ancestors were separatist. They were people that said, we're not going to have Rome control what, how we worship the Lord, number one, and the governments of Europe over there in Bavaria, basically, is where the Den Denklinger family comes from. You can look up, you know, if you're interested, if you're a Denlinger or whatever, or you just want to check out what I'm saying, um, there's actually, you know, Denklingen over there, Denklinger Rotwald. There's a red forest over there that's named after the Denklinger family um, in Bavaria. So that's where I'm from. That's the bounds of my habitation. But we left that, my Christian separatist ancestors there, uh, they left because of the Catholic persecution. And they came here to get away from that and to worship the Lord how they you know, believe in the Bible, that the Bible says to worship. Because the, you study out Roman Catholicism, it's not, it's not based on the Bible. Okay, um, It's very far from it. But you see, God set up bounds proper bounds you say well well but but see there's so many people now that they're you know all these different uh, races within their their genealogy yeah i know that i know that there's a lot of people that are divorced you see you see where we're going with this whole thing god's original standard is hey i set up these bounds don't leave them hey i want you to be married to the same person for your whole life don't mess around with it but people get away from those that perfect standard that God originally created. Now, as a preacher, I can look and say, well, it's going to make me more popular. It's going to make me more, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, people are going to relate to what I'm saying more if I preach the modern way and not God's perfect standards that he originally created. See, it'll make, it'll make me more popular and, you know, the whole deal. I can do that. Or I can say, you know what, God's perfect standard is and preach it as it's been preached. Let me show you here this, this thing of the bounds. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I said in one of my live streams, I think not too long ago, but you know, verse 18 and 19 or something, no, those verses 8 and 9, but we're going to start in verse uh, 7. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Had somebody correct me in the comments, and thank you for that correction because I was wrong. I gave the wrong scripture reference. Deuteronomy 32, chapter 32, back in the Old Testament. You know, written to that you have the thing written to a New Testament born again believer in Acts chapter 17, and it's Old Testament back here. So this is one of those things that has not changed from Old Testament to New Testament. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, beginning in verse 7. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee, thy elders and they will tell thee. Um, I have been having conversations with my father and simply saying earthly father, in other words, and uh, not giving as a religious title, you don't understand what I'm saying. And um, he has told me some of my ancestral names. And I've been looking into it and things, and that's how I found out this stuff. Um, verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So way back there, way back near the beginning of God creating this earth, um, he said, hey, I want you separated. I want to send you people out into bounds, boundaries, in other words. 
I want you to go to that land over there. You there, go over to there. You there, go over to there. He wants people to be separate. He wants distinction. That's God's perfect standard that he set up. Now, the modern world, it's all jumbled. It's all mixed up and whatever else. Now, I could be a lot more relatable to people if I would just preach that, you see. Doesn't matter who you marry. Doesn't matter where you live. Whatever, whatever. Um, uh, yes, it does matter. Um, if you want to live by God's perfect standard. If you want to reject what the world is doing and say, you know what? I care more about what God thinks of my life than what people think of my life. I want to live as close as I can to the Lord, to his perfect will in here. What did he set up? I'm not going to go with, well, yes, but I can prove that people departed from that. So then I'll go with that. No, you go with the standard there. And as a preacher, I'm going to preach his perfect standards, regardless of, of if I'm perfectly following those or not, because it's, see, it's, I'm not the authority. The Bible's the authority. But let's see when, when God separated there, when God separated man. Go back to Genesis chapter 11, the very first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 11. Here you have the very first uh, one world government, so to speak. All the people trying to get together, they didn't quite, it's not really a one world government because they didn't really achieve it, but they were trying to. And this will show you what God thinks of one world governments, of one humanity, like the black pope said, in his speech to all the Jesuit world out there on uh, April 2nd, 2020 here, just about, uh, actually exactly one month ago from today. Today's May 2nd. April 2nd is when he gave that address, and he was talking about we are one humanity and everything else, showing that the guy is just a devil-possessed lunatic. He's not, you know, worshiping Jesus, you know, the head of the society of Jesus, and yet he doesn't even understand what Jesus' will is, what Jesus wants. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. One humanity. <laughs> and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain, plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Interesting whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Hmm. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And God was very pleased with that because everybody had joined together and put aside their differences. They were, they were able to marry whoever they wanted just as long as they loved each other. Uh, no, that's not what the Bible says. God is coming down and saying, oh, look at this, the people are one. That's a bad thing. That's not what I wanted. I said, go separate, go spread out. Oh, no, we're going to come together and build a city and a tower. Isn't it interesting that most of the cities out there build big skyscrapers? Hmm, still doing it. Not much has changed. Man is still just as wicked as he always was. Let's continue. Verse 7. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or Babel, however you want to say it, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. He scatters them out, and then he says, Okay, now I'm going to make boundaries. I'm going to set the bounds for you people. Stay in bounds. That's what I want. God wants to see the differences in the different races. We'll just use the modern term. God wants to see the difference. The differences there. He wants to see the Germans dressing a certain way and the Africans dressing differently and, and playing different music and eating different food. God wants to see that. He wants to see the Chinese doing their kindred thing over there, their, their racial uh, cultural things and whatever. He doesn't want blending. All right. Um, America started out right. 
when my ancestors came over and other separatists came over and said, hey, we want to just get away from the control of Rome. We weren't coming here to slaughter the Indians and take their land. Okay, That was papists and, and Protestant papists that came over and were doing that stuff. You study it out. Okay, uh, the white separatists were coming and trying to befriend the Indians, all right, the native people of this country. We wanted to learn from them and things and, and whatever. That's why that my home you know, county, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, still had a lot of, of Indian names. We didn't just, you know, Christianize the area. We, you know, I went, I graduated from Pequay Valley uh, High School. Pequay, uh, that's Indians, okay? We would hang out the Susquehanna River, you know, and I could just, so many different uh, Native American names down there. We weren't trying to come in and conquer the people. We just wanted to get away from Rome. And then, the papists followed us over here, uh, just like the papists still follow this ministry and try to bring me down. Interesting. Not much changes. <laughs> but again, what is God's perfect standard? God likes cultural diversity. And that doesn't mean that you're, you know, some person that's not Chinese and they're trying to pretend that they're Chinese or some guy that's not Jewish and he's trying to pretend that he's Jewish or something like this. That's not cultural diversity. Cultural diversity is, what bound do you belong to? Do that. Uh, one of the greatest blessings in my life has been moving to northern Maine. Uh, why? Because northern Maine is climatically and, and uh, very, very similar to where I would have come from, to where my ancestors originate from. So now, a lot of the foods and things and the climate and whatever else that, that we have here is very similar to what my ancestors would have been used to. Pennsylvania, eh, there's parts of Germany that are, that are similar to Pennsylvania, but uh, not like up here. I love this northern climate. I, I think it'd be terrible to live down south. I can't imagine not having snow in the wintertime. I mean, it's May 2nd and we still have snow, you know, and lots of it in certain areas. But let me show you another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And by the way, this, this whole thing of, well, we can show, I can find cases of interracial marriage in the Bible. I can find them. I can find them. Yeah, and every single time you find one, there's negative things, you know, connected with it. You say, like what? Well, how about Ruth and Boaz? You say, well, that was, a, that was you know, it's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It went down to produce him you know, and, and everything else there. So it's in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Okay, but what, what's the story all about? Naomi and her husband leave Israel. They leave, they go to, you know, Moab, Moab or whatever, and, and the Lord kills Naomi's husband and her two sons that had married interracially. People seem to forget that part of the story of the book of Ruth. And then when Ruth comes in, there's an inheritance issue, and so Boaz says, okay, I'll buy her, essentially, and she'll become my wife, and then I get the inheritance. Not quite the romantic story that most people like to make it out to be. Ruth the Moabitess, and she marries Boaz, and, and it's this, oh, they love one another. Uh, not in the modern contemporary sense. No, they don't. All right? And again, there's typology there and things, prof prophetic things of the Lord marrying a Gentile bride. Okay? It's in type. It's not saying the Lord is his perfect standard is now changed and he's cool with people, you know, marrying interracially. You know, uh, again, you, you'll find this anytime that there's a there's an interracial marriage in the Bible. There's always something negative attached to it. Somebody says, hey, th why did they do that? Hey, this is wrong. Hey, that's bad. You know, whatever else. Timothy, the son of an interracial marriage, Jew Jewish uh, mother and a Greek father. OK, and it's well reported of by the brethren. And Paul has to take Timothy and have him circumcised. Why? Because there's problems there that's being spoken against. People are saying, I don't want to listen to this guy. He's a, he's a product of an interracial marriage. You say, but, but I'm the product of an interracial marriage. Okay, realize that's not God's perfect standard. It isn't. I wish I was back in Bavaria or something. It's not God's perfect standard for me to live here in northern Maine. All right? It isn't. It simply isn't. But with all the situation and everything else that's going on in this world, to be able to go back over there and whatever, I don't even know how to be able to do that. Probably get thrown in jail for preaching the way I preach, you know, over there. 
But you know, again, my life isn't a standard. Your life isn't a standard. If you're the product of an interracial marriage, that doesn't mean that you can change what the Bible says, right? Doesn't mean that you can change the scriptures. I can't change the scriptures because I'm out of bounds. I have to preach God's perfect standard. You see what I'm saying? And do my best to try and live by God's perfect standard. If there's some way I can eventually move to Germany in the future, well, I'm going to take that opportunity. Go back to Bavaria or whatever else, I'd love to be able to go there. Right now, don't have the money for that, okay? <laughs> Lord has me here for a reason. So, but let's continue here. I'll show you another one of God's standards, perfect standards. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 through 15. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. You know what God wants? God wants distinction. God wants men to look like men and women to look like women. Okay? Short hair. I'm not going to come out here looking like Goldilocks or some kind of thing or whatever else. Long haired, beautiful, long curly hairs or some. No, no, no. I'm a man. God says, short hair. I used to have long hair back when I was a rebellious teenager. Long hair, you know, heavy metal, the whole thing, whatever else. And I got saved, and the Lord said, cut your hair. Okay, actually, I cut it before I even got saved because I had, you know, sense. But now, if you told me, you know, why don't you grow your hair long? Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Uh, my wife, long hair. Goes down to her, her waist. Why? Because she wants to look like a lady. She doesn't want to look like me. And I don't want her to look like me either. So you say, but, but, but you see, there's, there's, there's people out there. There's things out there. Oh, you mean man's standards? Or are we talking about God's standard? God's perfect standard. Well, it's popular for women to wear pants now. Where did that come from? Women's suffrage. Female rights in the early 1900s. The flapper era. Women started putting on men's clothing. They didn't go to the department store and all of a sudden, hey, there's female pants now. That's not what happened. They started to say, we want to vote. We want to be in politics. We want to do all the stuff that men do. So we're going to start to dress like men. And you follow it today. The transgender movement of 100 years ago was women dressing like men. Look it up. You don't have to believe me. Look it up. So if you're dressing with pants today as a woman, well, you're still following that same trend. That's not God's perfect standard. If you have short hair and you wear pants as a woman, you are transgendered in God's sight. Just as simple as that. You say, well, but, but I just don't agree. Then you're disagreeing with this. This standard right here. Don't tell me you're not. I mean, women for thousands of years wore dresses. All of a sudden now in the modern era, now, you know, women in the past didn't understand how to sew pants. That's why they didn't wear them. But women now are so much more ahead. Right. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1. And any preacher, by the way, that, that goes against God's perfect standards, it's one thing to say, yeah, you know, well, I've got my issues and whatever else. I'm, you know, I'm, I don't live in the bounds of my habitation. Okay, I'm admitting that. Okay, I'm, I'm telling you, hey, that's a problem. I wish I could. But uh, I'm not going to say that the, it would be wrong or sinful or whatever else or, or wicked for me to live in Germany or something. I'm not going to preach that. But you'll get these guys that call themselves preachers and they'll preach against women dressing modestly, women having long hair, whatever else. They'll preach against God's perfect standards. That's a problem. Or they'll preach that interracial marriage is fine. That's a major problem. Okay? They're going against God's standard. You see. Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If you're a man pleaser, you're, you're not serving Jesus Christ. You have to go contrary to what most people think. Period. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
You see, the, the, the fact of the matter is the true gospel and the truth of God's word is supernatural. It's not intellectual. I can't appeal to your intellect. I, I can give, and the whole thing is, I can, eat, I can give people the statistics and the, and the when did this, the, the women's suffrage thing come in. And I can go through all that stuff and still people won't be convinced. I can give you the best arguments and, and debate things with people and whatever else. If, if you're not spiritual, you're just not going to get it. If the Holy Spirit's not there to convict you and to show you truth and to guide you into all truth, you're not going to get it. Plain and simple. So for me to say, I'm going to change my style of preaching to be more appealing to the masses. I'm going to try to, you know, just, you know, take it easy. And I've had people tell me that. I mean, literally when I would preach at church buildings and, and whatever else, I'd have people come up and they'd say, you know, I, I, I think you mean well, but man, I just, I'd back off a little bit. Don't be so hardcore. Don't be so militant, you know, whatever else. And I would just think, so you basically want me to turn against the truth of God's word? Well, no, 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 not turn against it. Just kind of tone it down a little bit. How can you tone down truth? Truth is truth. First Corinthians chapter four. Turn to First Corinthians chapter four. You know, this, this stuff isn't just for preachers, okay? It's, it's for Christians. I'm convinced of that. First Corinthians chapter four. We, we have to live by standards the standards of the book. And if you're not perfectly following them, you know, you say, well, I, I can't, you know what? It, I mean, if you're the product of an interracial marriage, well, okay. Uh, you can't exactly change that. Um, but don't justify it. Don't say, well, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I, I can, I can prove that it's okay to leave the bounds of your habitation, marry whoever you want to marry and whatever else, because my family did it and we love Jesus and whatever else. So therefore it's okay. Uh, uh, no. Um, well, I'm a woman and, and, you know, long hair is just too hard to take care of. And I think it's better to just have short hair and, you know, for, for my job and whatever else, it's better to wear pants. Uh, 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 no. And, you know, women working outside the home would be another good one. You say, well, here you got this woman here and she's, you know, she got, uh, married and she was married to a lost man. And, you know, they got divorced, and, and after she got divorced, she's taking care. She's a single mom, taking care of her children, having to have a job to put, you know, food on the table, whatever else. And then she gets saved. Well, what's she supposed to do, huh? Well, that then I should just, I guess, say, you know, to appeal to women like that, I should simply say that, well, in, in certain cases, it's okay for women to, to be, you know, to not be keepers at home. You see, I have to preach God's perfect standard. Young women are to marry, bear children, guide the house, be keepers at home. According to the scriptures, 1 Timothy chapter 5, Titus chapter 2. It's the way it is. Well, that's not very appealing to the masses. <laughs> okay. Uh, whatever. I'm supposed to please God and not men. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll read a bunch of verses here. Verse 1, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Faithful to what? People's desires? People, what people want to hear? Faithful to a book that God is the author of? Verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. What does your judgment really mean about me? If it's just your feelings and your opinions. Um, I'm not even going to judge myself by my own feelings and opinions. Why? Because there's a perfect standard that exists. That everybody's judged by. Whether or not you believe it. Verse 4. For I know nothing by myself. If you know anything, it's because God revealed it to you. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. If I get off and messed up and whatever else, the Lord will, you know, he'll judge me. He'll take me down. He'll say, okay, uh, you're done. You're finished. You're no longer one of my stewards. 
Okay? Verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. God knows everything about me. He's my judge. And therefore, I have to preach His standards. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you should be puffed, or no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory, as if thou hadst not received it? Um, King James Video Ministries continues to this day because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because I've tried my very best to preach God's perfect standards. That's why. Um, it's not because Brian Denlinger is an intellectual. I think I've proved that one very well over the years. <laughs> not an intellectual. Uh, it's not because Brian Denlinger is, is great of speech and eloquent in manner and whatever else. And I have the right connections and the right you know, size church building and whatever else and huge following. And, you know, no, uh, God gives me things. Um, this, this study, you know, is something that's been, you know, I woke up the other morning really, really early and, and about an hour or two before I was going to get up about three 30 or so. And, um, just laying there and, and just, just thoughts started coming into my head. Why not do a study about this? And that's that's oftentimes how it'll be. I'll be out working outside or walking through the woods or whatever here. And the uh, Lord will start to speak to me. And um, he gives me my studies. And you say, well, but when, what about when you make mistakes? Well, then it's my mistakes, not the Lord's. Okay. Um, the standard for when you're watching ministry or, or listening to preaching and teaching is um, when the preacher says something that lines up with God's word, then it's the Holy Spirit speaking through that preacher. When the preacher says something and you think, wait a second, what? <laughs> no, that's wrong. He quoted that scripture wrong or he gave the wrong scripture reference or, or what he's saying there is contradicted by this other verse. Um, okay, then that's that's me speaking. You say, well, then, then we should just cross you off. No, you should stick with God's perfect standard. You see? Um understand that I've tried to do my best over the years. Um, and the Lord has given me this ministry. Whether or not my enemies like to admit that. Um, there's a lot of things that have happened as a result of this ministry. A lot of people have gotten saved. A lot of people have gotten straightened out. And uh, I honestly don't even know how many people. Um, I don't want to know. I don't want to make records of it because I don't want to steal any glory from the Lord. It's all about Him. If the Lord has done something in your life as a result of this ministry, well, you give him the glory. Praise the Lord. Um, that's just the way it is. And I just wanted to, to do this sermon. The Lord put this in my mind to, to preach and, and teach because, brethren, we have to stand by God's perfect standards. And what has happened in the world and, and where we're at and whatever else, I mean, we are in the end times. So to say, well, because things are this way right now, then we need to update the Bible to fit the modern world. No, we don't. Um, you say, well, I'm, I'm in situations, brother, where I can't really say that this is God's perfect standard. Okay, then don't make excuses for it. Just have to admit it. Um, you know, I, I've been reading, uh, there was a biographical annals of uh, names in Lancaster County. My wife printed it out for me a while back, and I was reading it this morning a little bit. And because uh, the, the actual book, we found one on eBay and it was, you know, $500 or something because there's very few in print. It was written in the uh, early 1900s, I believe. Late 1800s, early 1900s. And um, just seeing all my, the, the family names, Brubaker, Denlinger, you know, uh, Fry, F-R-E-Y. And, um, you know, Campbell was another, you know, family name in my ancestry. My grandmother on my mother's side. So, uh you know, but, but looking at everything and just seeing, you know, how, uh, you know, the, the history of, of people coming here to America and just seeing 
they're getting involved in business and, and they're getting involved in farming and I mean it's mostly farmers is my ancestry from Lancaster County um, but you know they had the right motives for coming here um, a lot of them did and predominantly Mennonite uh, the Denlingers and Brubakers especially the Fry's not so much so and the Campbell's definitely not but um, you know, they, they had some of the right motives, I'll say that way. Maybe not the right motives, but they had some of them, you know, correct. But, uh, you know, do I want any part of that stuff anymore? No, I don't. Um, things have changed down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, I don't want anything to do with that anymore. And like I said, in the future, I don't know what the Lord has planned. Um, I love my the, the property that the Lord gave us, this land here that we're on. I love it. Uh, I love it dearly. And, um, but would I leave it? Yeah, I would. Um, I want to try to get as close as I can to God's perfect standards for me. I think it would be a, a amazing thing to, for things, the, the climate to change in Europe and, uh, things to be, you know, change where I could actually move back. Um, I think it'd be great. And, uh, it's not because I think the, area is beautiful or I, I, you know, have or whatever. It's because I want to get as close as I can to God's perfect standards. So, um, you know, figure it out, whatever it is that God has for you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a neat thing. Um, it's not, you know, when the Bible condemns endless genealogies in the scriptures, it's about the Jews trying to figure out, you know, the Messiah and all this other stuff and, and, you know, the what line did this and what line did that and whatever, uh, you know, when it's condemning endless genealogies in the book of Titus, I think it is, it's about the Jews. Um, there's nothing wrong with looking into where your family comes from, where your ancestry comes from, all right? So just wanted to do this study. Like I said, Lord put it in my mind. Um, don't conform to this world. Uh, that's another thing that's very important. Um, God's perfect standards. That's what you conform to, as found in the King James Bible. So that is going to be it. And uh, a little bit windy out here today, right now. But um, I hope it's been a challenge to you. And we will see you in the next video. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.